No. Yes. Okay. Um. So just let me take yep. a look whether on YouTube the stuff is starting. I hope so. Okay. Yeah. Um. Welcome, people, to our third lectures at home session today. We have Maxim here. Maxim is Microsoft Cloud Developer Advocate. Maybe he can introduce himself a bit to you, and we will learn from him an introduction to serverless, as you can see in his slides. Okay, then I will hand the microphone to you. Awesome. All right. Um, so hi. So my, first, my name is Maxime Huye, and uh, it's totally fine if you're trying not to say my name because uh, it's been one of the names the most butchered in my uh, organization and it's kind of a very hard to pronounce unless you're french or you know a little bit of french all right so today we're going to do an introduction to serverless uh, with azure functions so like i just said earlier uh, everything that we're going to be showing now today is going to be focused on serverless with an implementation in azure functions and what that means is as long as i'm talking about serverless you can apply that to Azure to GCP or AWS. Uh, when we're going to get into more specific or things that I'm talking about Azure Functions itself, that's where um, the other providers may not themselves implement the same thing that we do or do it exactly the same way. But the same rules and the same principle still applies. So let's get this rolling. All right. So the first question here becomes like, what is serverless, right? I like that's a thousand dollar questions. Uh, it's always funny because um, like the, the word is bad. I mean, it is literally bad because um, the first thing they, that, that that's a joke that was mentioned in Microsoft when we were having our people uh, visit a campus or the data servers and uh, we had our clients that were just walking through the servers and we're like, this is where like, oh, this is where our, our uh, Azure function stuff is there. So they were like, oh, so that's the serverless stuff, right? Oh, but we found the server. So you're not serverless, we found the server. So yeah, we know the name is bad, serverless, but we don't control that name. But it's got a cool name as well. So think of it that way. Serverless is not about no servers. It's about caring about the server less. Oh, right? Put a space in between. Um, that's why I think it's still a very cool name. So before the cloud, right? Anybody, anybody remember those times? It, uh, well, I'm not that old. I mean, I'm 35, 36. Um, so I, I haven't seen those kind of computers way back in the day. So let's just think about like those computers way back then. Those computers had massive amount of space that were taken in. Sometimes it would occupy like half a room, and there would not be more. There would be less performant than what you have in your pocket right now, which is the cell phone. And those computers were very basic. And if you wanted to connect to those computers, you had to use terminals, which were just a dumb like screen with a, with a keyboard on which you could reserve sometimes on the main uh, on the main mainframe so you could run some code and then you would have the result printed out and you would go from there so that was back in the old days and that was bad right it, i mean yeah, there's no way for you to host anything on this there's no uh there was no advanced programming language it was no advanced computing paradigm it was just a computer, it was mostly run by scientists or um, engineering students or people that really knew what they were doing. So we're a little bit far away from this, but our, the type of application that we have right now has really evolved. And whether you are hosting like an email, um, you're, sorry, you're hosting a retail application or you're hosting your own project, um, what the first thing you're actually doing is that you're hosting that 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 application on what we call an on-premise server. On-premise server are literally running on the machine. So if you're taking a computer like a tower that you would buy at a store, 
you could take that com that that tower install the right version of Windows or Linux and configure uh, an Apache or an IIS server and then you would have to install the like the right libraries and you could set up the whole computer and host your application on this. This is what we call on premises. But the problem is it raises so many questions. I mean what I just said was kind of like quick but like are you which OS are you supposed to use, right? I mean, are you going to be hosting it on Linux or Windows? Does that even matter? Then what happens if like the the disk fails on it? What do you do? And what happens if the server reach capacity like 100% CPU, 100% of RAM, and you want to start scaling it? Like you really can't do that until like you go back to Dell and say, all right, um, I would love to get another server rack please and that's going to be ten thousand us dollars oh okay uh yeah sure we can do that and you're not even sure if it's going to be enough or if it's going to be too much so all of those questions you see on the screen are the kind of question you ask yourself on your own premise and they are mostly what the uh the it folks are are paid to ha to answer like what kind of servers should we buy uh, what type of OS? Should I keep it up to date? Where do I store all that data? Is it secure? What is the so all those questions? Those IT folks are taking care of this. But when the cloud arrived, we kind of moved away from on-premises because the thing is, we're not giving you access directly to a raw server. So we offered you instead something around virtualization. It's something that companies were already doing before the cloud. So before the cloud, what you had was you had those big solutions with VMware, where you would you would install this application on multiple servers and would allow you to split this monster machine with maybe terabytes of RAM, like multiple CPUs, which themselves have multiple cores, and allows you to create this kind of farm of VMs, VM for virtual machines. They're like kind of computers, but virtually created. So they're not quite directly running on the server itself, but they're kind of running like abstracted away. And that allowed us to basically create the cloud. And at least that's where Amazon got most of their stuff pretty well. Um, roped in in the beginning because they were very good at creating uh, Linux based um, IaaS solution, which allowed people to rent those VMs on demand. But there's still a lot of question here to answer, right? I mean, you still have to take care of the patches, the backups, and like what application is maybe you just want to trigger another queue so you can just output it there as well. Or maybe you just want to store everything in table storage or SQL tables that is also possible. So there's, it's kind of the glue of everything else. If you've ever seen a service like uh, Logic, the Logic Apps, where now it's Power Automate, like this is the kind of things that you do, but you have more control with it. And okay, so there are multiple ways to run function here. Uh, and I'm not gonna talk about all of them because they're gonna be, they're gonna be so much more complicated. Um, the main one we're going to be focused on today uh, are going to be those two. So let's go back here a little bit. So IoT Edge Preview, basically you can run this on, on Raspberry Pi. Azure Stack means that you have thousands of dollars ready per month for you to pay for some specialty hardware for you to run your own cloud within your own company. So. consumption mode um, you have to think serverless because Azure function itself is is not serverless 
itself. Okay, so it's uh, it's a little bit special, I agree, but Azure Function is not it's not serverless itself. It's the consumption plan that comes behind Azure Function that is a whole serverless model, because Azure Function is just a, de a, a development model. This is where you it's a way for you to create code that will run somewhere. But the way we handle that code, which is on Azure or more recently on Kubernetes cluster, uh, it is how we we scale it that makes it serverless. Otherwise, it's just a way for you to create code that will respond to event and create outputs and stuff like that. So the same Azure code that you can run on Azure, I can run it locally on my own machine. That is not magic, it just works. Um, so, I, I'm just going to go through a different, a, a few different scenarios that are possible for um, for Azure Function to put things kind of like in perspective. Like, what are the kind of things that we can really do with it? So, there were the application backends that we talked about earlier. So you make a request, things are like queued up on a on a bus, and the the function is depiling them and sending it the output to a storage. So that was one of the example. Uh, those are the slowest transition, by the way, I've ever seen. Um, anyway, then there are mobile application backends. So if you're building a mobile app, the thing is you never know really if somebody's always on or if somebody is going to be requesting your app. So you may have a mobile application that's going to make an HTTP function uh, called to one of your Azure and then store some data. And then as soon as that data is stored, you may want to have a, a trigger that will then start notify, no, notifying people. So those are just two functions that are basically paid per usage at the consumption. Or maybe you have some of those IoT device that are producing tremendous amount of data, like crazy amount. And although you're sending all that data to IoT Hub for, uh, for ingestion, uh, you may want to have to handle some cases with code that will be able to scale. So if you're sending millions of events and just like 10% 10, 10 of those events needs to be processed, how do you handle an application that is hosted with specific amount of servers with a specific size? But you have IoT device that just goes from generating no events to suddenly generating a million events without you having to pay per month, like like hundreds of dollars just to be able to handle that. Serverless is a pretty good solution in that case to respond to those kind of things. And, oh my God, those are really the slowest translation, transition time ever. Or maybe you're just doing conversional bot processing and stuff like that. So maybe you're you're running uh, you're running queries and you want to make sure that those kind of things can can scale. So obviously, uh, you're if you're a company that has like a small amount of customers in a region, and then there's no more uh, from eight to five and people are are answering your questions. Uh, and then after five, the problem becomes. There's no more. There's not really a ton of call. But you still want to be available. You still want to be online. Well, functions and uh, serverless is kind of a way for you to be always there, uh, even when technically you're not. You don't want to have like massive servers available for you, but you still want to have some presence here. Or even better, you can start uh, handling uh, file processing. So you can start having like those those, those crazy queries that uh, run this piece of code that would, for example, decrypt a, a PDF or analyze it and then send some OCR and then save that data to it. And okay, we can skip that. Uh, real time stream processing, even even again, I think we can skip. Uh, automation of schedule task. That's one of the things I was talking about. That is one of the things, by the way, that I'm using all the time. I'm I'm creating a lot of test projects and fun projects and things that I'm creating all the time. And the schedule is always fun because you can if you create an application that would give you a summary of what is your what your week is to come, and you have the code and you can access this data. Uh, you can basically say, you know what, Azure Function run every Monday of every week, 
and send me, I don't know, a trillion messages with um, with a summary of everything that are that is to come, All right? And the way we, we bill Azure Function is we basically give you a free quota of a million call uh, per month. And if you're calling them once a week, so that makes four calls in that makes four calls in a week. That's basically free. So you're running like you're running you're running scheduled application. You're running code that normally you would have paid like five, ten, or twenty dollars a month, and now you're paying nothing. And that's one of the things that I really, really, really love. But that's not that's not for me like the, the the amazing stuff behind it is that they managed to basically do the whole open source project. And so all those things that I, I pasted over there are basically, um, let me just do a copy of that link if I can. I can't. All right, so all of those links are found in the very first one. So github.com slash Azure slash Azure functions will give you a link to all the other ones. Not only do we have the runtime that is open source, we have the SDK. So everything that uh, we are building Azure Function with is there. All of our extensions, so all the input, all the triggers, all the outputs, all that code is open sourced as well. Uh, the CLI that we're using behind the scene is open source. The portal, so if you're on Azure.com, well, on portal.azure.com, and you're in the UI and you see the actual Azure UI, that part, is open source as well, uh, as well as all the samples and all the templates that we're using. So there's one thing that, are, that is missing over there that uh, I should have added, uh, and it's the uh, the, Keda, uh, the Keda support. Let me just see if I can quickly uh, pull up this and see if I can find Keda function in Kubernetes. If you're looking for something very interesting, uh, we can now run um, Azure Functions on a Kubernetes cluster. So this is not going to be covered today because there's a lot of things going on, but basically you can you can run a lot of, a lot of things on Keta and that allows you to get um, to get on this. And that part, I think, is also open source. Um, I don't have the URL right away. Let's see if this takes me somewhere. Yeah, keta.sh. If you're if you're interested in this, let me just paste a link in here in the chat. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that is available. If you just click on the GitHub icon at the top, you will be taken to this repository with everything that is um, necessary for you to run it and build it. All right. So um, after half an hour of of slides, I think that um, I think we can get back to actual code. We can start doing some demo. Anybody want to do some demos? Want to see some actual code now? You can type in the chat if you want. And if you have questions, uh, I, I forgot to tell you about this, but if you have questions, please do take the time to write them in the chat. The chat is visible from my window and I will be answering them um, when possible. All right, so let's end the slideshow for now. And let me bring up some code. Demo sounds good. Okay, uh, we, we like demos. So, okay, so now I have a questions. Because like I said, I can do things multiple ways. I can do them in Node, or I can do them in C Sharp. And I want to present something that you guys want to watch and or any of you want to watch. So what do you want? Do you want C sharp or do you want node? This is an open question. I'm not moving forward until we have an answer. Node, please. Okay. We can also do both. I think we have time for both. I can do them in Visual Studio as well or in, um, in VS Code. Then both. All right, Dominic. I think we're uh, we're we're on a roll here. Let's do this. So let me just uh, bring up some um, some demo code. So see demos. Let me just remove all this. 
those are just temporary folders and we're going to create we're going to create our file here so first let's start with vs code and node because node was the first answer i got so your voice is here here i have a whole bunch of extensions by the way and if you're wondering what the windows team the ms dust team here is is that you can just so you know you can change your IDE to different teams and MS-DOS is one of those. So if you're really um, nostalgic about Windows or if you're really uh, trollish about it, you can use the hot dog team, hot dog stand, uh, but we're gonna keep on this. But anyway, there's a whole bunch of different stuff that is already installed. So let's do show installed extensions. And one of the photos I want you to install if you're gonna be running those is Azure Functions. As long as you don't have deployment under Azure, you don't need the Azure account. But the Azure Functions is going to allow you to basically do everything that we need uh, to do all this properly and deploy. So you see here, Azure, click on it. If you want to run this code with me at the same time, feel free. Like we're, we're not going to go to crazy fast pace. So as you can see here, uh, I'm dooming myself because I have app service, I have storage, I have logic apps, and I have integration accounts. All those, <laughs> not interested. So Azure here is just a bucket icon so that we don't have like on the left icons for function, for storage, and all the different services extension we're doing. So everything that is related to Azure one way or another, like the app service or the functions are gonna be found under Azure. So we have our function and obviously I could sign into Azure. So we're, which we're gonna do later, but not now. So let's create a new project and click on this. At some point, I think my machine is about to die at some point. All right, so it asked me for a folder. So let's do in our demos and we're gonna select this. All right, so now we have multiple choice and technically, do Python, but we're going to keep that for the last part of the uh, of the hour because I want to make sure that the demos I show you now actually work. So we said JavaScript. We can do TypeScript as well. It's been a while since I've done TypeScript, and now it's it's, it's asking me like, what is the template you want to use for your first function? And there is a whole bunch of them. And like at the beginning, you're like, whoa, there's there's way too many. And the thing I would say is. Focus on things that are quite easy to do, wow. like an HTTP trigger. And let's call this one Hello World because it's always fun. Now they're asking you about the authorization level. And most of the time, you would want something like uh, a function or anonymous. Admin kind of requires you to have special tokens, but we're going to use anonymous for, for now because it's not that much complicated. Now this question is just about, do you want to add to the existing workspace? Do you want to open up in the current window? Or you want to open up in a new window? And we're going to just open up in the existing window because I have nothing else open here. And at the bottom right, you saw some notification going quickly that it was basically creating the whole thing. All right, so that's it, right? All of our stuff is here. We have functions. We could potentially, oops, we could, we could potentially just F5 from here. And oh, nice, it created directly at the root. So let's clear that up for now. So, all this is the main component of the Azure Functions um, uh, applications. Proxies, I would not look into it too much because there's a lot of stuff happening here. Um, package.json, always interesting, but we don't really have any dependencies because the code is kind of self contained. Everything that is located under local settings.json. That part is interesting because anything that is in local settings.json is basically all of your configurations. And those will end up being things that you can uh, have as environment variables. But we're never deploying local settings. So everything that would just work on your machine should be there and never put that file on GitHub because you will have, you may have some credentials in there. Don't do it. Be, yeah. Everything on GitHub does not disappear like that. And credentials is one of the worst. Yeah. 
Then we have host.json, and that is just specific to the way that the function runs. So this is this can be safely ignored for now. We add you a get ignore by default, so you don't have to think about it. So that's fine as well. And then functignore, ignore, uh, those is the those is the equivalent of the get ignore, except that it's for us. Like what kind of things that we should not be including in our functions that we should we should basically ignore. And then because we know it was created under VS code, we're creating a whole bunch of different files here. And let me just collapse those. So you can see here that we have func that would create um, that would create command and task for you to do the, M the npm install, the npm prune, and everything is already pre-configured for you to, to just basically run with it. And that is a debugger. And we're recommending some, some extensions. So what happened if somebody opened up your project and does not have the Azure Functions extension, right? Um, we could probably like disable it and have that pop in as a message. Because at that point we know that um, you're not running Azure Function extension and you may actually wanna have it there at some point because it, it allows you to do more stuff. So all of this, by the way, was just like the plumbing around the tools. What you wanna see now is those two files. Like, hello world is literally what we typed earlier. So what you want to have here is take a look at the index.json, and we have the hello world. So what we're going to do first, before even digging further, it says hello name, and that is based on the query and the body. So it, it, it accepts both get and post. That's what I'm assuming. So let's debug that. Let's make sure we can actually run the code. So let's do F5 or click on this. And it will launch something, I think, it's, is it in the terminal or is it in the debug console? Or output? Yeah, it's terminal. So it will run an NPM install. So that's the first thing, like all this build process we talked about earlier. It will pre-wire up, pre -wire, wire up everything that you need. So oops, let me just maximize that a little bit. So we're running an NPM install. We have nothing that is uh, dependent on, so it finishes qu quite quickly. Then it runs the func host start, which is a CLI that I'm talking. I was talking to you earlier. And if you don't have the uh, the extension, like this is not going to work. But if you have the extension, the uh, the CLI is actually going to be installed automatically on your machine, so you, you don't have to do it yourself. That is the actual function's work time starting up. So we see all the thing here, and we can just literally control click on that link, right? And we should have an exception or an error. All right, so where does that go? So we can go into, back into code. Let's collapse that for a bit. Oh, before we collapse, you can actually see here the request that was, um, that was function, right? Executing HTTP request API hello world, Executing this JavaScript HTTP trigger function to process the request. So you all know everything that ha that's happening here with which which parameters. So what I want to do is I want to put a break a breakpoint here. Can I put a breakpoint directly from right click, or I can do F9. Let's do F9. Or actually, I can put put a breakpoint right here. And we can refresh that page, and we're we're breaking down right here. So we could have the context, going to read the data. We have the request, and we know now it's a get with the original URL and everything that comes with it. But we want to say hello world, right? So what we're what we're going to do here is we're going to add name equal uh, world. And it's going to hit our breakpoint again, but this time we can see here in the query we have the name, so that would be read here world, and the body is empty, it's undefined. The response message is going to be built from from this, so we can actually start stepping over step by step. See here that the name is world, and we have a response message here, and before we send it over, 
let's remove all the breakpoint and run this code. And now we have the runtime or the packages or the way that things are made. We don't have any of those kind of controls. Uh, so what do we do, right? I mean, and I'm just gonna go back to the code to show you the um, that the awesome timer is actually like it, it is populated. So what, we, what do we do when we don't have control? Well, we have those kind of things. We're at a function of JSON, and we have index, and we have different different uh, format. So let me show you how to do it in uh, in C sharp. And I'm going to open up Visual Studio, but I could probably do it as well uh, with C sharp and VS Code. But I'm going to show you a different way to do it. So I'm going to create a new project, and in here I can like specify my language. I don't want test. I want to run thing on the cloud. Yeah, I think the cloud is good. Azure function template is right here with C sharp. Uh, we could probably use different languages, but C sharp is fine. All right, and this one is going to be called my function function app one uh, function app one. Let's create one here. And again, like the only difference here that you have is the the UI that is different, right? We have different triggers that are a little bit different because I use them in different projects. Um, so let's do the exact same sample this time with the HTTP trigger. We're gonna call this the anonymous one. And this one allows you to set the storage emulator right away. So I'm gonna use that. So let's create a project. How many of you in the room, if you can just uh, leave me a thumbs up or a yes in the chat, how many of you are uh, have used C sharp before? All right. So let's take a look at this code and the code that was generated. Yes, but in deep detail. All right. So let's take a look at the code that we generated for the function and compared to the index. So let's just collapse that for now. Move on the left, this one on the right. And we're gonna, so we're gonna take a look real quick at the, uh, at the solution explorer. And you're gonna see the same thing, right? We have local settings. This time the functions worker is a little bit different. So it is .NET instead of, the, instead of JavaScript. The host is a little bit different as well, but not that much. We have our code, we still have git ignore. And the difference here is we have a dependency on the functions SDK. That's it. We don't have that much more. Well, let's take a look at function one and we're going to collapse this for now. I could have changed the name for this. So what do we have? Like we're still doing the anonymous get and post. The difference here is that get and post instead of being um, in, 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 in two files, is everything is in one file. So this get and post are the same methods that you're seeing here. The anonymous is found here. So this is defined by the HTTP trigger, which is bound to an HTTP request that is our REQ that is there. And there are multiple options here. How did I make that happen? Sorry. So let me just do control space or control shift space and there are multiple ways to, to basically pop up the whole things. Uh, you could specify a route. You could probably specify a route here as well. We're reading the body differently than node because node basically is just everything is just an object that has already been deserialized. We don't have to think about it. Um, and so we're digitalizing dynamic data. It's, it's a concept for C sharp. Uh, but really allows us to not create an object, just to read a f just one field. So we're reading the data name out of the request body and out of the query itself. And whether the first one to be, to be there is going to be returned, we're gonna, it's going to populate our name. So like this code is the equivalent of this code. Yeah, I know. Node, one line, C sharp, four lines. Okay, I'll, I'll grant you that one. 
But then the response message here is going to be a response, and it's pretty much the same thing. Like if if it's null or empty, we're going to return uh, the hello world and the same text, same thing. But this time we're just going to return an OK object result, and this one is the equivalent of returning 200 with the response message. So that's it. And the name of the function itself is instead of being defined as the folder, for us it's just this. All right, so let's do function one and we're going to build this code and get, we're going to run it. So this thing here at the bottom says that it's building. And we're look good, so we're going to press play. So now instead of running in a within VS Code, we're launching the func.exe directly out of the out of the tooling, and it's running as a separate uh, as a separate window within Visual Studio. But basically, it's going to be the same thing you're going to see, like the Azure Function logo made with awesome, amazing ASCII arts, the different version of the tooling, the settings that are being read. Uh, the URL, which this one is not clickable, so I'm going to have to copy paste it. The functions that have been found, so a function app one, the function one that run, the names are a little bit different. So if I open up the browser, and I I can I cannot do exactly the same thing because I forgot to name it in a world. So let's just let's just take this part here. So this is basically the same thing. The function is a little bit, the name is different, but it's the same code, right? So we're starting with that. Um, let's go to our code and see how it is actually compiled and how it looks behind the scene. Open folder in File Explorer. I just want to show you basically that um, those things are just all the same. So if we compile and we're looking at a debug and we're looking like great way down deep, you're going to see here. Oh, look at that. There's a folder called function one and there's a function.json. So let's open up this file in Visual Studio. So even though you don't see it here, it is generated as part of the build. And guess what we have? We have something that is very similar. I would almost say identical. The only difference here is that we're actually loading from a DLL. We actually have a function entry point and we have some configuration source generated by the created by the compiler. But in the end, it's the same runtime. It generates the same file. It runs on the same code. It's just the framework is the same. It's just you're coming at it from different ways. So whether you're going to be running Java code or Python code or any other kind of code, you're going to you're going to be creating the same thing. And if I were to rename this function here, um, not F1, F1 is bad. If I were to rename that function to um, to Hello World, let me just stop the debugging on that before I, I go further because otherwise it's not going to allow me to rename. So let's rename to hello world. Yes, we're going to rename the class as well. And your function name here can be hello world. It becomes exactly the same thing. Now, the difference here is that you can have multiple functions within the same within the same code. So let's try to re-implement re the um, the schedule awesome from this. So I'm going to call this class my uh, my functions because this one is going to be the same one. And we're going to be renaming the method at a world. And here's something cool that you can do in C sharp. So instead of trying to sync up those, you can do name of and say hello world, which is just a reference to this method. So I, if I click on it, you see like I'm referring I'm referencing it. So if I, re I change the name of my method, the name of my function is going to change. So you, you can keep that as, as a trick um, to do that. 
So one way we can always do this is um, we can add a new function. And I'm a little bit lazy, so I'm going to go with my, um, I'm going to create a new file and we're going to use a timer trigger and we're going to be using star slash, oops, star slash 10, just like we did earlier. They say okay. And I'm going to copy, paste that into my other function right here and, and delete that file because I am that lazy. I'm sorry. So we have the schedule awesome and it's, we're going to, I'm going to use the same trick. I'm going to use the name of or schedule awesome. And we have the same thing. So we want to have the same code, right? So let's do function.json. This is called the awesome timer. It's not being used, so we're, we're fine. Um, so let's run this application right now. So this is going to build. It's going to open up a different window. And we're going to have code that's going to be running every 10 seconds. We can see here, by the way, a sample of the, of the uh, next five execution. So you know that it's running like every 10 seconds. And schedule awesome is being run. So let's take a look at the actual code, see how how it looks like once it's compiled. It's the same. It's the same thing we we're looking at earlier. As you can see now, the the function one has disappeared. We have had a world which has the same function that JSON that we talked about earlier. But now we can look at our timer, which is schedule awesome and open this one as well. And take a look at the function that JSON that was generated in our node example earlier. And we can see here that things are a little bit different to, to accommodate for the C sharp versus um, the versus node difference, but it's basically the same thing the same code, same things, just it's running from the DLL with an entry point instead. So does that make sense to everyone? So all those functions that you're creating are just an interface to the things that are we are already supporting. So all those extensions that we have, um, all those triggers that we have available, they're just, there's just an entry point. There's just a definition of the thing you can do. They are all pretty much supported on all platforms, pretty much. There is some caveat on some of them, but mostly they're just supported everywhere because they're just an extension to a response to an event. And those are implemented within the runtime itself. They're not implemented within your code. It's something that you're bringing along and you're not re-implementing yourself. So what if we try to take that to Azure, right? So let's do something to Azure together. And let me just open up a portal and I'm going to use the non-employee portal so that you're not seeing unallowed things. I want to make sure that you're, uh, you're seeing the uh, customer focused version. All right. So of course I have multiple application and multiple little fun stuff I'm creating. So, if nobody ever saw the, the Azure portal, this is kind of like the basic experience you have over there. So there's there's a lot of information on your first on, on your first visit, but here's a few things that you should remember. Like this little hem hamburger menu, if you pop it open, you have everything that is available there. And if you click, it closes, uh, but you can change that in your settings, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, you can either add a docked by default or you can have it a fly out. So if you like, like one version better, you can just start playing with that. Or if you're if you really like the blue, you can go with the blue. Or if you're more into a, a gray kind of person, you can do that as well. Or like any all the cool kids, if you're into dark team, that is good as well. 
I rather like this one because it's kind of a mix of dark and, and, uh, and white is pretty well. And if you have problem with vision, uh, there is high contrast versions that are available, of course. So let's go with a flyout version and all this. You can change your region and languages, but that's not that's not the important part. So those are all my favorite uh, services, and obviously Azure Functions is not part of part of them, and I have no idea why. So let's do a create resource here. And the first thing you're going to see here is that function app is right there. That's what we're going to be building. We're going to be building a function application. And then we're going to be deploying both our application to, to, to this thing. So yeah, I create a lot of stuff. So let's do uh, lesson at home. Can I do at in there? No, I can't. So at home. Okay, short break. Uh, yes, we can do a short break. We're going to stop right there. Um, and I will be back in about five minutes. So I will go grab a glass of water. Does that work for you, Sandra? Yeah, that, that, that would be fine. Thanks a lot. All right. So if you want a break, I'm going to be doing a five minutes so that you can all go take a, a bio break or wait for the recorder to start. I'll be back in about five minutes. about next week i think it's next week it is yeah but durable functions here's the fun part as i've been talking about durable functions for so long now that i can probably do it while i sleep so or even with a beer or two i think i think it goes even better with a beer or two so there right. was also a question in the chat oh sorry I stopped, I, I closed the chat for a reason. Can you possibly say a few words about how the function are scheduled? Okay. Uh, when to depend on data like blob storage. Okay, so we have to go through the docs a little bit. Uh, so the functions, how they are scheduled is a little bit. Um, and the recording is online again. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so we're going to be uh, going through the question first, then I'm going to go back to the code I was talking about. So, okay, in terms of schedule, we generated function.json, right? The um, the file that we created earlier uh, that we can see right here. Uh, that's one of them. Let me just pick the scheduler one because that's the uh, that's the interesting one we want to we want to talk about. So, right, we're we're creating this binding. So, what's going to happen here on Azure? especially on Azure, um, is we're going to read that file and we're going to put into storage the next execution times that we want to run that function at because we're going to be running this through a, 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 some code and we're going to know exactly when you're going to run. So when we're, you're going to be, the, uh, when you're going to run, we're going to make sure that your function is actually all warmed up and ready to go before you actually run it. So that's one of the coolest things that we can do with that is that we know when your function is going to run, like we just know. So we're going to make sure that this function is hot by the time it is there. And, oh, sorry, yeah, what? Good. That's good. Uh, I think it's Dominic that is unmuted. Oh, sorry, sorry, it's me. Uh... How are you, Dominic? <laughs> no, I'm fine. Sorry, just uh, my my computer crapped out this morning. You have it. Okay, no go ahead, no other questions. So we're gonna be able to basically just um, read that file, know when you're gonna run, and on our side we have uh, we have a component that is not open source because it's it only runs on Azure. It does not. It's not gonna run on your own machine. Uh, but we open sourced a version of it under Kita, the, the project I was talking to you earlier, got everyone uh, before. Ikeda.sh. There's a component in there called the scaling component that basically allows us to take 
code and scale it from zero to a thousand, right? And that scaling component, we have a version for Keta, but we have a version that is specialized for a cloud. And what we're going to do with that version is that that component is going to look at your function, try its best to guess when it's going to run and make sure your application is scaled highly enough uh, or is warm enough for this code to run. So if you have timer, we're going to make sure that your function is is warmed up before it's ready to run. When you have um, uh, when you have a lot of HTTP requests, we're going to make sure that we're scaling you up high enough. So that's scaling controller. Um, so that scaling controller is basically allowing is, is allowing you to do those kind of things. So that that is how to function or schedule. I don't know, Lucas, is that was your question, uh, but the um, we could probably take a look at the storage explorer. So I have the um, I have a tool installed on my machine that is called the storage explorer. That's it's worth uh, installing if you're dealing with storage one way or another. Uh, by the way, we're we're going in the deep end. By the way, right now, so we're we're off schedule, and we're off. The script and we're just having fun now. I'm going to go back to deploy that application, I promise. So th this storage explorer allows you to basically explore uh, either your local storage or your Azure storage. And I don't quite remember exactly where it is stored, but we have your storage available and the scaling controller is going to look at your storage for your function and basically know when it needs to scale your application up, down, left, right, or whatever it needs. So in this case, if we're loading this up, I don't know why my machine is slow, probably because I'm streaming at the same time. So so anyway, so while, while this is loading, we're gonna have the whole thing, and that's pretty much all the things is happening here. So let's see if, the, if you have any architecture over here. Yeah, so the Kubernetes here is that those things are going to run, uh, but Kida is like is that scaler? That's a scaler I was talking about, and for Kida, there is like many of them. Like there is many scaler. So if we're looking, for example, at I don't know the storage queues. Well, the storage queue is going to look at the queue length, and we're we're doing the same on Azure. It's just different it's not the same implementation i don't i don't even know if we're using kubernetes I, i'm not interested in those smaller details but my guess is we're working technically the same way is that we're looking at the length of the queue so if you have a queue that has i don't know five items in it i don't think it's worth scaling to a thousand servers because you're going to be able to unscale like to unpile that with just a single server and you're good to go but if your queue now is that has a million items into it it might be worth taking your uh, your your application and scaling it to two, then to four, then to eight, then to 16, 32, 64, 128, and to 56, and like and go higher up until the queue length is under control again. And we're doing the same thing for all the different Azure component, including uh, the different blob storage, so we can start knowing like what the um, the things that we, we're, we're, we're looking into, or maybe it's the uh, HTTP request. I have no clue if we have something for that. I think it's called external. So those are based on external scalers. So I, I don't quite know about this one, uh, but there's some stuff like that that we're, that, we're, that we're doing depending on those different implementation that allows us to basically scale. That was, by the way, um, 300 level of functions while we're supposed to be in the 200 or 100 level. So let's go back to <laughs> to the, the basics thing, right? So we're going to be creating the functions going to going to be hosted on my subscription on a resource group. Think of it as a folder. And then we're going to call this uh, intro serverless lecture at home. We're going to publish some code, and this code is going to be let's deploy the .NET Core version. We're yeah, 3.1 is good. Uh, I'm going to deploy it on East US. I could deploy it pretty much everywhere, but that's good as well. And we're creating a new storage account for this one. It's going to be a Windows operating system, and the plan type. That's the interesting part. Like, as long as you're on consumption, you're serverless. That means you can scale. You can scale all the way down to zero. 
that means we're not reserving any CPU or RAM for you until it is required. That's why it is so cheap. If you go to, to App Service Plan, that means that you're back on the past model we talked about earlier. You need to choose a machine size. You need to choose uh, a few of the different stuff how, to how many machines you want to scale and stuff like that. It's just like running a pass. You're just using the function way of coding, but with a pass. So this is not something interesting. Premium, however, that is the interesting part because it combines the consumption and the app service plan. It allows you to reserve some compute so that you can just have your application always on, always warm, even if there's no one on it. You're reserving compute. You're reserving CPU and RAM. But you're not limited to just a few machines as if you were on the app service plan. You can scale almost infinitely like the consumption plan, but this time using the premium feature. So it's kind of a mix. So for most scenarios, consumption is more than enough. Uh, monitoring is always good. For me, I always, always, always turn it on because when things start to go left or sideways or start crashing, you don't have access to the server this code initially ran, ran on. So you need logs, and this is the way for you to get those. Um, tags, more advanced features that we're not going to be talking about. Now we're going to review all this, and we're going to create it. So this is submitting the deployment. The deployment is in progress. And we can look at the resource group and see where things are in terms of deployment. We can see here that we have nothing, but Let's go back to this deployment window here. Basically, everything that we made, like all the choices we made, is just kind of the we we work with templates behind the scene to basically say like, oh, you want to have storage, so here's the parameters I need to create it. You want this, so here's the parameters and blah blah blah. Uh, Azure for students, yes. If you're a student, uh, this link Azure for students is worth mentioning. Like you, uh, you have access to credits if your uh, university is registered in the program, uh, which is most uh, most likely is. Uh, if you don't, um, by the way, that link allows you to get an Azure credits without um, without credit cards. If you remove the students' words out of the URL, now you need a credit card. So deployment is underway and it's done. We click on go to resource. And we're going to have intro serverless uh, lecture at home. And that is our app service. So let's look at the resource group and all the resources we created for that, because I want to make sure that we're clear. We have an app service plan that is consumption based, and we have our uh, application insights. We have our storage account where our data is going to be stored. And we actually have our function. It's called app service, but it's still a function. All right. But now the problem is if I click on the functions here on the left, right, there's a whole bunch of different stuff, but we don't see any any functions. We don't see anything because we didn't deploy anything. Or we don't have well, we have app keys, but let me not let, let me not show you those yet. So let's keep an eye here. And we're gonna go back to Visual Studio. And this one, the experience for it for this one is kind of it's kind of very neat. So we're just going to do publish, and we're going to say Azure and say next, and it's a Windows container, it's a Windows app, and we could have created the function directly from here, but it's nice to show the portal as well. So let's do finish. And it's going to start building, and we can look at the output for the debug or the web publish activity for the details. And it's going to start configuring this whole thing all by itself. All right. So let's give it a few seconds to see if everything's deploying properly. No, we have to click the, the publish button. Sorry about that. So let's hook this up. Everything has been built. So there's, from memory, I think there was like five ways to, to push your code to Azure. 
There's the Visual Studio way. There's the Azure, uh, the, the Visual Studio Code way. There's the, um, you can do it through the CLI. You, you can also do it through GitHub. You can do it through uh, Azure DevOps. And yeah, there's like literally multiple ways to do so. So the way that this one works, by the way, is uh, we're actually zipping the whole file and we're zipping the whole function to hold things all together. Publish succeeded. So if we refresh here, we should have some functions, I hope. Let me see the build. That's awesome. Right, there you go. Took a few seconds. So all this is amazing, but right, I mean, how do you even know it works? We can try it out with Hello World because we set that method to be anonymous. So we can go to that URL and say slash API slash Hello World and name equal Maxime. And I'm going to give you the URL straight in the chat so you can start spamming it if you want. And I left the uh, the name empty so you can just add your own. And here's why I want you to start hitting that because I'm going to go on to application insights because the timer one, we don't know when it runs, right? Like how many times is it running? And if we're turning application insights on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Apply all the settings. It's going to create the data, but you still have to like plug it in. So we're going to apply it. And we're going to go see the application inside data. And here's one thing that I love is that there's something called live metrics. So now every 10 seconds, you remember that the function is going to be called, right? Um, let's just give it a few seconds for this to, to start booting up. I may have been a little bit too fast for this one. Let's reload that page. All right. So as you can see here, oh, hello world, who called me? All right, we can start looking at all the requests. We can see that there's people doing requests here. Uh, can do a few new ones. The schedule awesome is still running. Uh, so we can start investigating all those requests and basically see who is calling me, right? And there's a whole bunch of them, of course, that have been that are available. But if you're if you start um, if you start hitting that API, schedule awesome is going to be there. But what about the, everything else? So we can start you looking at a usage or, or, or things like that. Um, let me see if we can look at a usage for all the events. I think it's events, if I remember correctly. So I broke functions a few times, and this is like a godsend. You need that tool to, uh, to be able to understand um, exactly how things are going sideways. Because once th things start to break, you can't, like I said, you can't go back on a server and leave like a log file. Like this is just not going to work. Um, maybe users. There is more, so. I always forget about this one, how to get, retrieve exactly what I want. Uh, so maybe this one is not quite yet up to date. Live metrics is always a way more advanced in terms of uh, receiving all the data ahead of time. But so let's not that have too deep on this one because obviously it's not there. Uh, but it basically allows you to retrieve all the all the necessary information for this, and we can see all the details of of those. We can look into the different performance. We can start drilling down into the data. There you go. We can see like schedule awesome was called sixteen times, but it'll world was called twelve times, and we can look into the samples of that code. For example, we can look into this one, event to end details, and we know here that it'll world was called, and 
what where was it called from? This one was called from Montreal, so that one is me. Hi. Look and view all the other telemetry that is around it. You can see other ones. Let's see this one. This one was okay. Who's in Munich, right? This was in, is in Leonberg. This one is in Munich as well. Boydton, Virginia. Okay, who's the American? Munich, Leonberg, Leonberg. Leonberg. So as you can see, like we're tracking a lot of different thing here. We're not tracking all the details, but we're, we have enough for us to be able to start debugging what is going on with this application. Um, that is on top of all the things that are already available. So just it's just a hint of like you you need this you need this stuff, and we could do the same thing. Uh, would add your functions in the different ways. Um, let me just uh, shut down um, that function because it's going to start running like every 10 seconds. And we do provide free benefits and free executions per month, but this is going to run like real quick. So on VS Code, if you would want to do the same thing, let me just first um, delete that one or leave it running for a few, few more seconds while we were running this one. You could go to Azure, and this time, again, this whole page that was like painful, um, we're gonna need to sign on. Because the thing is, uh, I was not signed in to Azure before, uh, especially not with this uh, with this VS Code. So as soon as this one loads up and we have a sign-in button, we're gonna be able to sign in. Uh, sign in to Azure. It's kind of a two-factor authentication. Yes, it is me. Goes back to localhost. You're signed in. You can close the page. Thank you so much. So when I come back here, I have access to my my same functions. I can just do. Um, I want to deploy to Azure Functions. That subscription. I want to create a new one in Azure. I want to name this one lesson at home node. Gonna select one of the latest version of node, select ECU West. Then it's gonna start creating the application and right from there, I'm gonna be able to deploy as well. So that's one of the many ways. Uh, one of the ways we did not go through today is through a proper, um, an actually proper C, uh, CI CD pipeline. Uh, if you're not aware of what a CI CD pipeline is, it stands for continuous integration and continuous deployment. Basically, it allows you to continually build your application and continually uh, deploy it. So as, as changes are being made, you always have the version from your source control that is being deployed. So in, in our scenario, this one's going to take a little bit more time to deploy. So the same time that we took for the other one. So. We're going to give it a few more seconds, but um, I would not spend too much time on this. Uh, that's pretty much all the things that I got um, for for this scenario. Um, I don't have any other demos right now, so if you have any questions, uh, I think we're pretty much go good for it. Okay, first of all, Thank you very much for giving us this great and amazing talk with all those super demos. Are there any questions? If you want to take anyone want to take the mic, feel free. Or if you would just want to type it in the, in the chat window as well, you don't have to take the mic if you don't want to. <laughs> Dum, dum, dum. So otherwise, I'm I'm running this slide.
so we can summarize a little bit quickly well, if there's people typing question or thinking about questions what we did today we basically re-explaining what serverless is why it matters and I have not talked about the pricing because the goal here is not a pricing, but if, if the question about the pricing is, is basically you have a million free execution per month and the rest is billed, but like if, I think it's cents per million execution. So it's like, it's negligible. If you're paying yourself a coffee every day, you're, you're in your money real easily. Even if you're paying yourself a coffee every week. Um, so let's not talk about that. Let's talk about like, what we did so we created a function both in node and c sharp and we could have probably done it in other languages as well we deployed that function onto the cloud twice one with node one with uh c sharp the one with c sharp went completely the other one with node is still in deployment right now um and we talked about the different ci cd pipelines and all the different options you have available for you to deploy your application and we went a little bit sideways on the Keda and the and the scalers are in the back, but that's just bonus for the people that want to have more in-depth details. If you have a question about any of those elements, feel free. If you have questions about other things, feel free. Or if you have question about things that are not Azure functions or serverless related, I mean, for me, it's like 1.45 p.m., so I have plenty of time, and I'm I'm here to answer them. And yes, this is the land of maple syrup, so. Okay, authorization level. So let's drop this thank you slide because that was just, it was starting to get weird. Authorization le level. So they are a little bit more complex and I tend to use them um, a little bit differently. That, by the way, is, is just someone that works at Microsoft and they work with keys. So anonymous means that you have no authentication required function means you have some keys that are based for your function to be called but other function can call them no problem uh admin requires those keys to be to be invoked and you have um authentication and authorization so if you're doing authentication for your application or you you want to do authorization for your function um i would require i would, I would ask of you to look at something called um easy off uh, this is the internal name, but it's like app service authentication and authorization. And it's something that we can put on top of this that would basically just allow you to use those providers. Like the, um, so most of the time I would not go with the um, admin or function or those with special keys because they are they work with keys and the keys are normally something you would use for, I don't know, for an application or for something that is very specific to your case, uh, like internal stuff. If you want to have authentication on your function, like, oh, I want to have somebody from Google that can use this Google account or his Twitter account to authenticate, uh, you, you, you need to use the actual function. And we can see that by going into our Azure functions let me see uh, the uh, authentication authorization part here. So we can turn that one on. So the app keys that we were talking about earlier, if you're sending your application to your function to anonymous, it will not require any of those. I can, I, I can just show them up and you're going to be good. Um, so you will need those keys to invoke the function if you have anything else than anonymous you will need those keys and they will need to be in the url and i have no clue why there's no system keys that must be something new uh but you can create new keys and new stuff and there's they're kind of okay but 
for me, it's not, it's not, that would not be the way I would do authentication in Azure Functions. It might be something that you want to have if you want to make sure that only your functions can call your functions, or if you're only calling from a single endpoint, that, like internally from your machine, you want to call it into Azure to your to a function that is, that is hosted there, then yes, I would use the, the actual code. But if you're going to be doing implement, authentication on proper, um, on actual code, like for people to use for a general public, I would go down here, authentication authorization, and I would turn that one on, and I would say like, log in with one of those. And you would have access to the same authorization process that you would be able, you'd be able to get. You'd be able to log in through all those. That's how I would do it. Does that make sense? Is that, was that your question? Awesome. So there, are, there's multiple stuff in there that you can start exploring. Um, yeah, so there's proxies, there's a lot, a lot of different stuff in there that, you, that, are, that are possible. There's a way to activate, for example, push notification for your phone. There's, uh, if you want to set a custom domain as well, that can be done. If you want to assign a custom identity to your app service, that can be done as well. Um, you can start setting quotas and uh, if you really want to have some fun, you can start going to the console, the advanced tool, or the different extensions are available. One of the things that if you're doing any hackathons or you're uh, you're having fun, uh, one of the things I would do is make sure that you do a, a star on one of those. If you're or if you know the URL that you would set it up, because that would block any API from being invoked. How would I create a function that pushes its output to an Azure messaging service queue? Messaging service queue. So that would be um, <clears throat> that would be service bus, right? Filter by title, service bus. Hybrid connection, app service, integrated Azure virtual network. Um, that's a good question. I haven't tested service bus yet because most of the time the students are not really into service bus because it's kind of a service bus. Service bus trigger. Um, let's go look into the binding. All right, so every API in the reference, every trigger triggers and binding that we have defined is right here in the reference on the left. Triggers and bindings are all here. Some have triggers, some have outputs, some have both. Uh, in this case, um, if we look at the overview, there's different stuff. We can look at like how they are defined. How do you create a function that responds to one of those triggers? It's made that way in C Sharp or in JavaScript or in Python or Java. You have all the example. So, like I said, like you can use this. That is for incoming. But if you want to, your your function outputs a different trigger, like I'll put an, a message to that bus. Um, you can do it in C Sharp by doing things like return. Like those are attributes you put on your function and basically say like, here's a queue, here's a connection I'm going to be using and whatever I put here in the string is going to be outputted as my message. That's how it does. Um, we can do it in this example, for example, in JavaScript, which is going to be a little bit different, but basically direction is out. The type is a service bus, so that's not the binding. So it's going to be using this one. So if we highlight this one, we're going to be we're going to seeing it properly. Um, and it's going to be using a connection. That connection needs to be defined in your um, in, in your settings or in your environment variables. And so you're going to be able to do like this binding, this output queue, and then start pushing messages. Because this is a queue. So the unit gonna, it's going to be an array. So you're going to have to define that array and start putting messages on there. So as soon as your context is done, boom, it's, it queues up all those messages to your uh, to your service bus. So I don't know all those by heart. So I have to go through the docs. And if any of you feels bad for going through the docs, um, don't. Like, I live in the docs every day because like things are changing so quickly that it's just uh, it's just a little bit crazy. 
Um, so talking about ducks, like if we're looking at this page right now, you can edit the ducks and it takes you to, to the Azure Docs itself. And that article on Azure Docs, have you looked at the amount of commit in there? Like it is nuts. And that's just a public repo. We have a private repo to synchronize um, announcement and release it during big events. And we're, we're like almost 600,000 commits on that repo. So there's, there's hundreds of people working on that docs and I can't keep all this. Yeah, please fill the survey. There's a link in the chat. Make sure that you click on that and you tell me if you liked what I what you saw and if you want more, um, let me know. Uh, if you want some specific subjects, also we can, if I can't do it, I can find you someone who can, but otherwise that's pretty much it. Are we all good? My pleasure. All right, so I think we're done. I think this whole thing is just, it's just crazy. Let's then do this. Um, so one of the thing you wanna do, uh, last last lesson before we're, we're leaving, um, make sure you clean up your resource group. So delete, type, type the name in there and delete because otherwise, you're going to be billed for things that are running, especially if you're putting in them on the, on the timer. So there is another resource group that I know that is I just created for, for the Azure Functions. It's in a home node. And I'm just going to delete that one as well. So all the keys, all the secrets that I showed you now, as soon as all this is going to be, it's going to be deleted. Nothing is going to be available to all of you. So like, that's why I, I didn't really care about showing you the, uh, the access keys and the secrets and all those kind of things. So all this is going to be deleted. It's in the process already. And I can technically shut down my computer and go watch Netflix and this whole like cleanup is going to be done for me. I don't have to wait until it's done. All right. So. Is there anything else? Otherwise, I think we're done. We're at time. Yeah, I think we're done. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I'm um, going to go finish that, that glass of water. <laughs> great. And we will see you next week. Thank you, man. Cheers. Cheers. Have a nice day. Thanks, you too.